Well, welcome, if it's your first time to the City Church, wanna welcome you, wanna welcome those of you watching online, welcome those of you at our Hope City campuses. We are so pumped you guys are joining us right now. Next week, just a promo for next week, we're starting a brand new series called The Vow. We're gonna be talking about dating and marriage. So so four uh, parts of The Vow, uh, priority, pursuit, and, and purity, all things dating and marriage. It's gonna be a great series, whether you're single or married, uh, to not only be here each week, but to bring a friend to. And so that starts next week. Well, let me see a show of hands. How many of you have ever seen a, t a kid's t-ball game or basketball game or football game? Any of y'all? I know parents, probably a lot of you. Okay. Uh, most of us have experienced this, uh, the, the, the chaos, right, of kids just running all over the place and running wherever they choose or please, right? I mean, in a kid's t-ball game, you got kids running to the pitcher's mound and the second base and all over the outfield before they ever make it to first base, right? In a kid's basketball game, you got the mob of kids kind of just following the ball wherever it goes. No one really knows their position or part. You know, they're just all following the ball like a big Ma, Brandon was telling me this week when his kids were growing up, he said his son was out in the field and him and a friend on their team were just punching themselves in their own crotch. He's like, it's the funniest thing I've ever seen. He's like, they're not playing baseball. They just were having, doing their own thing, right? Uh, I'll never forget my son, Coben, uh, when he was younger playing basketball, uh, the whole game's going on on one side of the court and him and a friend from the other team were just chasing each other, playing tag, like on the whole other side of the court. They're not even with the, they're not even with the ball, right? They're not even with the mob. They're just kind of doing their, their own thing. That's the, that's the chaos, right, of a kid's t-ball game, basketball game, football game, right? It can be very cute and fun and frustrating all at the same time. That's, that's a kid's game. But as you get older, you start to know your part, your position, your role, and the game flows a little bit better and it's played how it's supposed to be played. The only problem is as you get, you get older, you can actually accomplish something you'd accomplish what the game is meant to do, right? But, but then you can start to take it like too serious and it can become like a God or, or an idol in your life. So, so there, there's, there's positives and negatives. There's strengths and weaknesses like to each, to the chaos of the kids game, but, but then there's strengths and weaknesses to the, to the older kids game where they understand their part and they, they know their position and what they're supposed to do and they can actually accomplish something. There's strengths and weaknesses to chaos and order. Strengths and weaknesses to chaos and order. And there are some elements of both, chaos and order in the church. Chaos, like we get the, the movement of the Holy Spirit. And the scripture says that the spirit blows where it wants to blow, right? It, it, you, there's no controlling the, the Holy Spirit. So there's some, there's some chaos there. There's some surprises, right, by, by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's gonna surprise you. God's gonna do some things in your life and in the church that you didn't expect, that you didn't see coming. There's always gonna be some surprises. You're gonna have new believers in the church, hopefully, and there's gonna be a little bit of mess there because they're, they're just now figuring out kind of this Christian life thing. It's all brand new, and, and my God, I, I pray that we always have that kind of mess in our church, that kind of chaos in our church uh, of new believers meeting Jesus and, and then trying to figure out this Christian life for the very first time. There's some, there's some chaos in the church, but then the scripture also tells us that God is a God of order. And so in the New Testament, we also see a lot of organization, administration, structure, leadership, and roles to play in the church so that you can actually do something and accomplish something for the glory of God. We often say around here, we're a church that's of the word and spirit, right? There's order in the scripture and chaos in the spirit. We're a church of grace and truth. There's some chaos with, that comes with grace. But then there's order that's found in the truth. We're a church of unity and Diversity. What we mean by that is our, all of our ministries like are on the same page. We're all preaching about and studying the same topics and passages and things like that on almost every Sunday. Your kids are learning the exact same thing that we're learning in here. And so there's, there's unity in our mission and in our vision, but then we also seek diversity, like multi-ethnic, multi-generational, uh, 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 different incomes in our church, different political persuasions, right? That creates chaos. Uh, order in our, in our unity, in our mission, in our vision, but, but then there's chaos in the diversity. So order and chaos, we see elements of both of these in the church. We're, we're finishing 
our series called Creed today. Creed on the doctrine of the church. And so in the previous weeks, we've talked about who the church is. And, and then the next week, we talked about why the church exists. That's last week. And you can catch up on those with our, our app or our podcast. This week, we're talking about how does the church work? And when we examine how the church works, we're going to see a little bit of both. We're going to see some chaos and we're going to see some order. In this series, we've said a creed is like a fat guy in a little coat, right? You got a little coat, just barely covers the, right, the, the fat guy. It's there to kind of barely wrap your mind around something, right? That's a creed, that's doctrine, that's systematic theology. It gives us handles by which we can express our knowledge of God. It gives us handles by which we can kind of understand God, but, but not really fully wrap our minds around him. And so that's the purpose of creed. It's that we might grow in our understanding of who God is. We might grow in our understanding of what we believe and, and, and why we believe. That's the purpose of creed. It's to love the Lord our God with all of our minds. It's a series we come back to every summer that we're finishing up today that we might know basic Christian theology. And you might ask, well, why the church? Why are we covering the doctrine of the church this year? Well, the reason is that most Americans are grossly misunderstanding what the church is. Many do not realize who the church is, why we exist, why we do what we do, and what we're supposed to do in the first place. They attend church like it's an event, like it's something you go to when and if you have the time. And at the same time, there's never been a more critical spirit or distrust of the church in our country, in my lifetime, and maybe in the history of our country. Never been a more critical spirit or distrust of the church. And, and so my, my hope is in covering the doctrine of the church. Here, here's been my hope. Here, here's been my, my prayer is that the Holy Spirit will give us understanding of who the church is and what the church is supposed to do, what it's supposed to be like, that, that we might believe rightly about the church. That's number one. Then, then two, my hope, my prayer is, is that then we will respond rightly by the power of the Holy Spirit. We will respond rightly to who the church is and what the church is supposed to do. And then third, my prayer is the Holy Spirit will bring reformation, transformation, and purification to our own local expression of the church. That's been my hope. That's been my prayer with this series. And today we're gonna to finish up by talking about how does the church work? So if you got our app, now's a great time to bust that out. Uh, go to message notes, um, everything we're gonna talk about, there's fill in the blank. That's a great way to stay engaged in our time together is to fill in the blank as we go. Uh, there, there's points and quotes and verses, all that's gonna be there. And you'll notice um, all down the right side of those notes, there's blue boxes. You can tap that blue box and take your own notes as as we go. All right, let's dive in. How does the church work? If we're going to talk about how the church works, number one, we've got to talk about the nature of the church. We talked about a little bit about this in week one. We've got to talk about the nature of the church, uh, the, the construct of the church. That's kind of just the thousand foot view of, uh, of what is the church look like, the nature of the church. Well, first of all, the church is both local and universal. Local in that there's a local expression here as you and I meet together right now, this is the church. Then it's universal. It's this bond, it's this family tie that you and I share to all Christians all over the face of the planet. That's the, that's the church universal. And then you've got the church universal and eternal. The, the, the church that's made up of all those who've ever believed in Jesus, both alive and dead. It's so the universe, universal and eternal church. So, so all of these elements are the church at each, at each level. We said this in week one. Secondly, the church is both invisible and visible. That there's this invisible thing that happens in our hearts when, when God calls us out Right, as the ecclesia of God, this called out people that begin to meet together. So there's this calling out, there's this regeneration that happens in our hearts, this, this the conversion when we, when we first meet Jesus, okay? That's the invisible thing that God does in us where we're born again into a new spiritual family. We have brothers and sisters in Christ. There's this invisible tie, bond that you and I have together as the family of God. But, but then that invisible nature of the church inside all of us, the, the presence of God, the Holy Spirit of God residing in, inside of all of us, manifests itself, it always manifests itself in this visible, practical, tangible form. So, so the church is both invisible and visible all at the same time. The church is 
sometimes smaller, more organic. Maybe it meets in a home or at a park. You see a little bit more chaos in these kinds of churches. There's strengths and weaknesses there. And then you see the church also throughout church history and in the, and, and in the New Testament meeting in, in larger groups. Maybe sometimes it's more organized and maybe they meet together like now in a building. We see elements of, of both kind of kinds, of, both styles of church, both forms, both constructs of church, not only in the New Testament, but all throughout church history. And there's strengths and weaknesses to each form, to each construct. Wayne Grudem in his systematic the, uh, theology said this about the church. He said, we may conclude that the group of God's people considered at any level from local to universal may rightly be called a church. Now, now here's why we're talking about the nature of the church right now today, because, because we're seeing this challenge today, especially in our country and, and probably more so from a younger generation. We should not make, he says, the mistake of saying that only a church meeting in houses expresses the true nature of the church or only a church considered at a citywide level can rightly be called a church or only the church universal can rightly be called by the name church. Rather, the community of God's people considered at any level can rightly be called a church. Grudem says we can't get dogmatic about the style of the construct of the church that we find ourselves in, the nature of the church that we find ourselves in, to the disparagement of other natures or forms or constructs of the church, because there's strengths and weaknesses in each one. I'm hearing a lot today from the younger generation that like, I love Jesus, I love the Cap C church, but the American church is just a construct of church that isn't right or it's not biblical. I saw within the last year, Lecrae, a famous Christian rapper, post something almost exactly like this, and he has since apologized. Because he realized really quick, that's kind of an ignorant thing to say. Every culture has their own constructs of church. And the construct is always dictated by the context. The, the context that you find yourself in, like the people group that you find yourself among and their culture. It always dictates the construct of that church in that culture. And all constructs of church have strengths and weaknesses. No construct has it all together. And here's the great news. God has used all different constructs of the church, both in the New Testament and all throughout church history. And gosh, I am so thankful and grateful for that because in case you haven't realized it yet, we're pretty messed up and we don't have it all together. And our construct of church is not the only way or the perfect way to do church. And so I am super thankful that God in his grace and his mercy uses imperfect constructs of church for his fame and glory and for our own sake. He's used all different kinds of constructs of church, both large and small both more chaotic and more orderly. The church is made up of people that have invisible spiritual unity that is visibly expressed in our gathering. We said this in week one, the true church is the invisible becoming visible. That's the church. It's this, the, what God is doing inside of us invisibly manifesting itself in this visible, tangible, practical way where you and I see each other and gather together and worship God and, 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 and go on mission together with Jesus and study the scripture and pray. Well, like everything we talked about last week, it's this invisible becoming visible. Secondly, if we're gonna talk about how the church works, we gotta talk about the governance of the church, governance of the church. And when we talk about governance, we're gonna talk about three different kinds of structures. Episcopal, Presbyterian, and Congregational. Now, we're not talking about denominations here specifically, although all kinds of denominations have obviously formed under one of these three forms of governance, and sometimes there's a, there's a mix, like in, especially in our case. So Episcopal, Presbyterian, and Congregational. When we talk about the Episcopal system of governance, we're talking about a structure of the church along a more monarchical or imperial lines, like the authorities in one person, like a bishop, and then over that person is like an archbishop. So authority in one person, and then there's someone over him, or there's authority in that one person, and then someone above them, authority in that one person, and down and down we go. So that would be the Episcopal system. The Presbyterian form of governance 
is more like a representative democracy. It's more like a republic. It's not completely con con uh, congregational where it's completely democratic. You've got people, elders, who represent the congregation that lead the church. But then in the Presbyterian denomination or form of government, there's actually like groups above that local uh, elder board, synods and sessions and, and, and so forth that, that oversee. So that's the Presbyterian form of governance. It's a representative democracy. And then you've got the congregational form of governance, which is both autonomous and democratic, autonomous in the sense that they're independent and there's no board above the, the local expression of that. There's no authority over the local leadership at that church. So they're independent, but they're democratic. And almost all the decisions and leadership is done by voting through direct democracy. Now, here's the thing. A lot of us have been in all kinds of different backgrounds. We've seen the strengths and weaknesses of, of each one of these kind of forms of, of government. And what you'll find in the New Testament is some scriptural evidence for each one. You, you just, you can. You can find some scriptural evidence for each form of government. But oftentimes, what, what I have found is that you're going to see this mixture of early versions of each one of these. There's, there's a mixture. It's like you, you see Episcopal, and then, and then you see Presbyterian, and then you see some congregational aspects. And it's like they're all kind of moving and working together. There's been great success and pain experienced at the hands of each form of government. There's strengths and weaknesses to each one. There's not one form of governance that's cornered the market on how you do it. There's been pain and success experienced at the hands of each of these forms of government. So what are we? Well, we're kind of a mix of Presbyterian and congregational. Now, again, I'm not talking about denominations. We're, we're non-denominational. But we would be a mix of Presbyterian and congregational. Remember the two kind of concepts with congregational is that it's autonomous and democratic. And so in the sense that a congregational church is autonomous, where it is independent and self-governing, there's no external power that dictates the courses of action to that local church. We are congregational in that sense and that we are independent. There's no board or person outside of our local church that tells us what to do or what to believe. So we're independent in that sense, in the sense of a congregational form of governance. But then we're also Presbyterian in the sense that we're led by elders. Elders are appointed by other elders and affirmed by a congregation. Appointed by other elders and affirmed by congregation. So we believe that elders are both appointed and affirmed. So elders that know the person, that have spent time with the person, that have interviewed that person, that have studied with that, that have prayed with that person, right? That, that know their involvement, their commitment, and their, their, their desire to lead in that kind of capacity, right? We, 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 we've seen that, we've tested them. Oftentimes our, our elders, at least the last two that we've had, they've gone through almost a year of interviewing and studying systematic theology and, and all kinds of different uh, uh, things that we're, where we're testing that person and we're finding out if this person is really someone that could lead in this, this office. And so then we've brought that person forward to our congregation and we've said, hey, this is Mitchell Anderson. And um, we, we believe, our elders believe, 100% uh, uh, unanimous that, that Mitchell should join our elder board. And then we say, hey, what do you think? And we give you two or three weeks and we tell you, hey, if, any, if there's any reason that you see that he shouldn't be one of our elders, then you come and let us know. And so that's the, that was the last person we did. And two or three weeks go by, there's not a word, not a peep. And so there's affirmation there. So appointment and affirmation. We see both of these aspects in the New Testament. Paul tells Timothy and Titus, appoint elders. But then we also see oftentimes the, the congregation like approving of those elders. And so we say elders are appointed and affirmed. Elders in the Presbyterian sense would then represent that local expression of the church. They would represent that local body. But we're not completely Presbyterian in the denominational sense because, again, there's no outside body or board that oversees our local congregation. Elder is the Greek word episkopos. But when Paul tells Timothy or Titus to appoint elders, he uses it in the plural form, which is presbyteros. That's the Greek word presbyteros. Usually in the New Testament, 
The word elder in Greek occurs in the plural, giving us this sense or this suggestion that the authority of elders is collective rather than individual. And so we believe in what's called a plurality of elders. There's not one single elder. I'm not the one lone voice or authority in our church. No, we believe in a plurality of elders. And so we have what's called an elder board. And they have met and live up to the qualifications that we find for elders in the New Testament. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 3, he said this, this is a trustworthy saying. If someone aspires to be a church leader, this is a, a word that's interchangeable for overseer, ruler, bishop, elder. We, we see the same Greek word translated for almost all of those uh, different English words. He desires an honorable position. So a church leader must be a man whose life is above reproach. He must be faithful to his wife. He must exercise self-control, live wisely, and have a good reputation. He must enjoy having guests in his home, and he must be able to teach. He must not be a heavy drinker or be violent. He must be gentle, not quarrelsome, and not love money. He must manage his own family well, having children who respect and obey him. For if a man cannot manage his own household, how can he take care of God's church? A church leader must not be a new believer because he might become proud and the devil would cause him to fall. Also, people outside the church must speak well of him so that he will not be disgraced and fall into the devil's trap. Paul tells Titus, some of the same things in Titus chapter one, verse six through nine. An elder must live a blameless life. He must be faithful to his wife and his children must be believers who don't have a reputation for being wild or rebellious. A church leader is a manager of God's household, so he must live a blameless life. He must not be arrogant or quick tempered. He must not be a heavy drinker, violent or dishonest with money. Rather, he must enjoy having guests in his home and he must love what is good. He must live wisely and be just. He must be a devout, he must have, live a devout and disciplined life. He must have a strong belief in the trustworthy message he was taught. And then he will be able to encourage others with wholesome teaching and show those who oppose it where they are wrong. So these are the qualifications to be an elder in the church. Our elders here at our church are myself, Pastor Mark Tatum, Pastor Brandon Gwynn, Pastor Barry Alvis, Mitchell Anderson, and Kobe Colley. Now you might be wondering, well, that's okay, elders, but, but what about pastors? Like, I thought that was kind of a big deal. That's kind of who runs the church and all that kind of, like, what about pastors? Well, technically, pastor is a different Greek word than elder. Technically, they are different words. And in fact, we only see the Greek word pastor in the New Testament, like once, and some people will say twice. Elder is the office that's most of the time being referred to in the New Testament. And so most people assume it's the same role. There, there is lots of overlap there, but it's not clearly stated that elder and pastor are the exact same role or the exact same office. So my opinion is, my opinion is that it could be the same, it can be the same role, but it doesn't have to be. Because the Bible doesn't clearly state it, that they are one in the same office and they are two different words. My opinion is, and the opinion of our elders, is that it's not necessarily, that it can be the same role, but it doesn't have to be. And in a church in our size, while all elders pastor, like care for people, shepherd the, the flock that's been entrusted to us, all, all of our elders are called to pastor people not all pastors are going to be elders. And so we have many pastors on our staff that are not in the office of elder, of overseeing or ruling over our church. We have many pastors on our staff that are not elders. And because not all pastors are going to be elders, and since elder is the only office in the church that is clearly gender specific, we have a woman pastor who teaches, and I expect that we'll have more. So that's the, that's the difference, and that's how that practically works out. Elder, the office of elder is clearly gender specific when you read the New Testament. The office of pastor, I don't think it is, because I see those as being two different Greek words and could be a different office all together. All right, if we're gonna talk about how the church works, finally we have to talk about ministry in the church. Ministry 
in the church. As we said in week one, we are one body with many parts. And so there's not one part that does all the work of the ministry in a church. No, there's one body with many parts and all the parts are doing the work of ministry. And so as we start talking about ministry in the church, here's where we got to start. When you gave your life to Jesus, you received the Holy Spirit. We believe at that moment of your conversion, you were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter one says, when you were adopted into the family of God, you received the Holy Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing your redemption one day. That wasn't one quarter of the Spirit. It wasn't 50%. It wasn't 75% of the Holy. No, you receive the Holy Spirit of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, Paul says this, for we were all baptized by one spirit to form one body and we were all given the one spirit to drink. And so at that moment, you received the Holy Spirit of God. And now as a follower of Jesus, you seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit on a regular basis, but, but you received the Holy Spirit at the moment of conversion when you gave your life to Jesus. And we said in week one, and we've talked about this a lot, that it's the Holy Spirit that gives you a passion for Jesus, a love for holiness, a hatred for your sin, a desire to worship Jesus and follow Jesus and serve Jesus. It's that's the Holy Spirit of God that does that inside of you. But but something else the Holy Spirit does in the new covenant, in the life of the follower of Jesus is give you a ministry for Jesus to bring glory to Jesus, not yourself. The Holy Spirit gives you a ministry by giving you a spiritual gift. You, if you're a follower of Jesus, you have a spiritual gift or gifts. And one of the chief ways the Holy Spirit equips the church for its mission is through the bestowal of these spiritual gifts. One body, many parts, all serving and operating in their gifts in order to build up the church and bring glory to God. Michael Byrd, And his systematic theology called evangelical theology said this about spiritual gifts. A spiritual gift is an empowerment from God for God's people through the spirit for spiritual work in the church. Some gifts appear to magnify ordinary attitudes and talents like leadership, generosity, and helping, while other gifts are out of the ordinary and have a supernatural ability like prophecy and tongues. Wayne Grudem and his systematic theology defined a spiritual gift like this. A spiritual gift is an ability, is any ability that is empowered by the Holy Spirit and used in any ministry of the church. Spiritual gifts are given to equip the church to carry out its ministry until Christ returns. So three points on the gifts of the Holy Spirit as a whole before we kind of dive into each one of these gifts. Number one, Paul tells the Corinthians, You are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 1, 7. You're not lacking in any spiritual gift until Jesus returns, until Jesus comes back. So what that means is, is that at our church, we are not cessationists. And you're like, a cessation what? A cessationist. A cessationist believed that the more out of the ordinary spiritual gifts ended in the early church. Like they were present for the explosion of the gospel, authority uh, to give authority to the gospel, but they ended sometime in the first century in the early church. We are not cessationists here at the city church. We believe that all the gifts, the ordinary or the out of the ordinary, right? If you're a Baptist, some of you are like, what, tongues? Probably, that's, that's ordinary to me. Some of you Baptists, you know, are like, That's out of the ordinary, all right? Okay, listen, we believe all of the gifts, both ordinary or inordinary, you know, whatever you wanna call them, weird, right, if you're Baptist. Okay, all of the gifts are in operation in the church today because Paul said you're not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the return of Christ. More specifically, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 10, Paul, speaking of prophecy, tongues, and words of knowledge specifically, he says this, They will remain until the time of perfection comes. That's when Christ returns. That these more out of the ordinary gifts will remain until the perfection, until Jesus returns. So you could say that at the city church, we're charismatic with a seatbelt, right? We believe in all the gifts. We're not cessationists. We believe in all the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but with a seatbelt, right? They submit to the word of God. And, and we do them and we operate in them in the way that the scripture tells us to. So, so, so that's number one. Number two, just note about gifts before we dive in. First Corinthians 13, verse 10, 
Paul, speaking of the gifts, specifically prophecy and words of knowledge, he says this, they are imperfect or partial. Imperfect, they're partial. Here, here, here's what he's saying, that these gifts specifically, these kind of more out in the ordinary gifts, prophecy, uh, words of knowledge, that, that they're imperfect, they're, they're partial, and so in our hands, we should be treating them with a whole lot of humility. Like, like you follow me here? If they're imperfect and partial, like in our hands, then we treat these gifts and we operate in these gifts with humility, with a very submissive spirit to the scripture, number one, and then to the local uh, leadership at our church. Third, your gift is to primarily be used in the local expression of your church. Doesn't mean it's not gonna be used outside the church or in some other ministry or some other fashion, right? But your gift is to primarily be used inside the local expression of your church. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 26, that all of these gifts, he's speaking to the church, all of your gifts should be used for the edification, for the building up, the growing of your church so that we all might be built up. Your, your gifts are to be used primarily in the church to build up the body of Christ. All right, now let's dive into each gift. All right, you ready? You don't look ready. I know it's rainy and cloudy and you just want to kind of like sit back and cuddle up, you know, or whatever, you know. All right, but listen, that's not going to work for right now, okay? You're going to have to sit up, okay? Get the list in your hand in the app, right? We're gonna, it's going to be on the screen, okay? You're, you're going to, I'm going to lose you, I know, here in just a second because you're going to be like, that's not my gift, that's not my gift, you know, okay? Uh, you need to sit up and lean in, okay, and engage in our time, all right? If you wanna make the most out of our, our time together, okay? So let, let's dive in. We get this list from Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 4, and 1 Peter 4. Now, most people don't believe the list of the gifts in these passages are exhaustive because we see different gifts in each list. And so we don't believe this is like some sort of conclusive list and there are no other gifts. No, these are just the, 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 the gifts that we find in the scripture, but most people do not believe this is exhaustive. There, there's one or two that we're gonna take a little bit more time on because they're a little bit more controversial. And then the others we're gonna spend a lot less time on because they're more self-explanatory. And here's my hope as we go through the list of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is that the spirit's gonna kind of move inside of you when we get to one of yours. Because if you're a follower of Jesus, you have a gift or gifts. And so as we, as we go through this list, here, here's my prayer, lean in, engage, because I believe if you do, if you're a follower of Jesus and you're not kind of sitting back zoned out, right? Thinking about lunch or that nap you wanna take later, okay? Okay, if you will lean in and get, you, you might just be prompted by the Holy Spirit in these moments that we had, that, hey, that, that could be my gift. That could be my gift. And God's gonna ignite something inside of you as we go through this List. All right, number one is prophecy. Grudem says prophecy should not be defined as predicting the future, nor as proclaiming a word from the Lord, nor as powerful preaching, but rather as telling something God has spontaneously brought to mind. That's prophecy. Ordinary congregational prophecy in New Testament churches did not have the authority of scripture. You gotta remember that. Prophecy does not, all caps, right? All cap does not have the authority of scripture. Prophecy was not spoken in words that were the very words of God, but rather merely human words. Prophecy never threatens or competes with scripture in authority. It is always subject to the scripture as well as to the judgment of the congregation. You're like, where do you get that? Why, why is that prophecy from that prophet or that apostle not as authoritative as the word of God. Well, Paul tells the Thessalonians, speaking of prophecies, he says this, test every word and hold to what's good. You don't do that with scripture. We, we submit every, we submit in every way to this. It is authoritative, the words of God. We don't argue with it. We don't test it. It is the word of God. With a prophecy, Paul says, no, you gotta test it and then cling to what's good. In other words, hold to what's good, cling to what's good and disregard the bad. Do you see how prophecy does not have the same authority as scripture? Hold to what's good, get rid of what's bad, disregard it. You test it, you don't test the scripture, but you do test prophecy and decide in your own spirit, is this from the Lord? You don't, you don't have to do that with 
Scripture. Those with the gift of prophecy or apostleship do not hold the office as those that speak or write the word of God. The office of prophet or apostle no longer exists. And so if someone comes along saying there's some prophet or God or they're, they're an apostle, you probably need to run. You need to run. That office no longer exists. A prophet or apostle speaks the very words of God. They write scripture. No one today does that anymore. The canon of scripture is closed and that's, that's clear. Jesus said to John in Revelation, no one's gonna add or take away from anything in this book. It's done, it's final. The, the canon of scripture is closed, right? And, and so when people speak today a word of prophecy, it's always submitting to the scripture and that, that office no longer exists. There are those with the gift of apostleship, we'll talk about that here in a second, or the gift of prophecy, but, but we have to be very careful and even run probably from someone that claims to be a prophet or apostle. I, I know people that are gifted in these ways and they just don't go around saying, I'm the prophet, I'm the apostle, listen to me, thus saith the Lord. That's not what they do. You need to run from someone like that. Even charismatic theologians I studied this week said this about prophecy. Prophecies that tell someone what to do should be regarded with great suspicion. If there's some prophecy over you and it tells you what to do, thus saith the Lord, you should regard that with a lot of suspicion. Another charismatic theologian said this, you gotta be very careful with prophecy, very careful. Another one said, it can sometimes be a confirmation, but it's never a direct word from God telling you what to do, telling you the mind of God or the thoughts of God. That's not what prophecy is. Sometimes it's a confirmation of what God's already doing in your life or something the scripture is already saying. So here's your best bet if you have the gift of prophecy. Here, here's your best bet. You, you say things like this. I think God may be saying. You, you hear the humility there? I think God might be saying this. I think the Lord is putting on my mind that blank. Or it seems to me the Lord is showing us this. You, you, you hear, you sense the humility there? It, it's never, this is the word of the Lord, thus saith God. Run when you hear that. But if someone says, hey, I think, I think someone, you ever hear Pastor Barry give, give a word of prophecy, right? Or a word of knowledge sometimes at the end. Of, I, I think the Lord might be saying, I think God might be doing this, and then it confirms in you, you confirm it in the word, right? That, that's the gift of prophecy. Next is the gift of apostleship, different from the office because the office doesn't exist, but there are those with the gift of apostleship. This is the ability to start new works. It's to church plant. It's to pastor pastors in a movement, or it's to minister cross-culturally as a missionary and to start a brand new work. This is the gift of apostleship. Next is the gift of teaching. This is the ability to understand and communicate biblical truth in a clear, relevant, and engaging manner so there is understanding and application. People with the gift of teaching just read the scripture and they just automatically see this clear way to communicate. It's like an outline forms. I, a lot of times I, I'm reading the scripture and it's like an outline's forming in my mind. Like I'm seeing this clear way that, to understand this and to communicate the word Usually these people have a passion for the word of God. They can clearly, boldly, and passionately explain it. It might be to hundreds, but for most of us, we're gonna use this gift in a small group or teaching kids or teaching students or college students. We're gonna use this gift. Most of us are gonna use this gift in a smaller capacity, not preaching to hundreds or thousands. Some, some might, some will. And we saw earlier that elders must be able to teach in some capacity, whether that's leading a small group or Again, preaching to, to hundred, whatever that case might be, that person is able to teach the word of God. Next is the gift of pastor or shepherd. Pastor, shepherd. There's an office of pastor, but it doesn't have to be. There's people that are gifted with pastoring or shepherding. Oftentimes these people are small group leaders, right? They, they care for people. They like meeting with people one-on-one. -on -one. The gift of pastor or shepherd is the ability to care for, counsel, and build up Christians in their faith and take responsibility for their long-term spiritual welfare. They love meeting with people and caring for them and praying with them and reading and studying the Bible with them and fighting sin together with other people. That's the gift of pastor and, and shepherd. Next is the gift of service or helps. 
This is the ability to joyfully work alongside other people to help them complete tasks behind the scenes. You ask a person that's gifted with service or helps, hey, you wanna come up on the stage and read this or do this? And they're like, whoa, no. That is not me, right? I wanna, I, I wanna serve in a kitchen or in a room or do something like, or, or set out parking, you know, whatever needs to be done, I'll do it behind the scenes, give that to me. But some of you, when we've asked you to like come up and read the scripture for us, when we've been going through the gospel of Luke, you're like, you got this look on your eyes, like, oh my gosh, like I'm getting dizzy. <laughs> you know, just, just with the question, right? Okay, chances are you're, the, you're not probably the teacher, the leader, okay? You may, maybe you have a gift, of service or helps. Next is the gift of hospitality. The ability to joyfully host people in your home, feed people or organize parties so that people get to enjoy each other's company. You know you have the gift of hospitality if you have like 10 times more seating at your house than your immediately family needs, okay? If that's you, chances are maybe you've got the gift of hospitality. You like to party, okay? You like to host, you like to cook, right? You like to organize, okay? That's that would be you. Next is the gift of encouragement. This is the ability to motivate, encourage, and console others so that they mature in their walk with Christ. Those with the gift of encouragement are usually very positive. They lift you up. They have a lot of friends. They're super nice. You feel better after being around them. And I'm convinced that the people with the gift of encouragement use a lot of emojis, okay? I don't. I don't have that gift, but I'm just convinced that if you use a lot of emojis, you, you might have the gift of encouragement. All right, next is the gift of giving. The gift of giving is the ability to joyfully share, give away, and steward money, time, and resources in order to meet the needs of a person, mission, or organization. You have this just supernatural joy and passion to give and to meet needs. And sometimes we think, well, that, that person would have to be rich in order to do that. And that's not the case. Oftentimes it's very poor people have the gift of giving. Money hasn't taken an idol or a root in their heart. And they just, they love to help people and give financially, even when they can't afford to do so. People with the gift of giving are great gift givers. They love to make people feel special by giving them a gift. Next is the gift of leadership. This is the ability to have a clear and compelling vision and articulate that vision so that others are compelled to follow you. Leaders just have people follow them, right? If you don't have anybody following you, chances are you're not a leader, okay? So that, 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 that's a leader. They make decisions. They're, they're strategic thinkers. They take risks. Next is the gift of administration. This is the ability to organize, give direction, and make decisions for efficient operation and accomplishment of goals. You people love highlighters, right? Task lists, like note cards and sticky notes, okay? You like spreadsheets, right? You're like, oh, a spreadsheet, right? You just, you get so excited, you geek out over that spreadsheet and all the formulas and functions and you know how to use, you know, right? That, that's, you might have the gift of administration, if you like rules. If you're a rule follower and you just love rules and when people don't follow the rules, it just flies all over you, right? Maybe you have the gift of administration. Next is the gift of mercy. This is the ability to have unusual compassion and empathy for people that are hurting, suffering, or even done wrong and offer assistance or relationship. Those with the gift of mercy have an unusual understanding of the gospel and an incredible understanding of their own depravity. And so because they understand the gospel so well and they understand their own depravity so well, they're moved with compassion and empathy for those that are hurting, suffering, and, and even the one that's done wrong and messed up. They have this supernatural compassion and empathy for people. Next is the gift of discernment. This is the ability to quickly perceive whether people, things, ideas, or events are from God or Satan. Those with the gift of discernment hear a prophecy and they're like, uh, I don't know about that, right? A lot of us, like, we're, we're quick to believe it, okay? Those with the gift of discernment are like, yeah, let's, let's see, okay? Let's test this out. We're gonna prove that, we're gonna make sure this is true, right? That's someone with the gift of discernment. They, they can discern false teaching and false teachers, right? Or false prophecies, maybe quicker than some of the rest of us. They have the gift of discernment. Sometimes these people are 
Debbie Downers in the group, right? Because <laughs> they're like, yeah, I don't know about that. You know, they just seem like they're not, they're not very positive, right? Because they're, they're always testing something, okay? That's the gift of discernment. Gift of wisdom is next. This is supernatural or even practical insight into people and situations that is not obvious to the average person. And it's combined with an understanding of what the Bible says to do and how to do it. If you have the gift of wisdom, chances are people are coming to you for advice. Chances are you're a very practical person. The gift of knowledge or word of knowledge. This is supernatural knowledge of a situation that would be a word of knowledge or the practical ability that would just be the gift of knowledge to research, remember, and make effective use of a variety of information on a number of diverse subjects. People with the gift of knowledge love books, right? And you like paper books. You don't want this digital stuff. You like books. You love a good footnote. And not only are you going to click on the link for the footnote or go to the back of the book for the footnote and read the footnote, you're gonna go get the book that the footnote was about. And then you're gonna go read that book, okay? That's those with the gift of knowledge. They like to study, they like to research, and they love footnotes, okay? Okay, next would be the gift of evangelist. This is the ability to speak clearly, passionately, and effectively to non-Christians about Jesus. Those with the gift of evangelist have this balance between the urgency to share the gospel, but the patience to not push someone unnecessarily away, right? They have, they have some wisdom there. They, they have this balance there. They're typically fun people. They're friends with a lot of non-Christians. They use the word born again a lot. You gotta get born again, man. That's, that's the evangelist, okay? Uh, it's the evangelist that sits next to someone on a plane and is like, hey, if this plane goes down and you were to die today, are you 100% sure you go to heaven, right? That's the evangelist, okay? Next is the gift of faith. This is the ability to envision what needs to be done and to trust God to accomplish it, even though it seems impossible to most people. This is the person that says, God can do it. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do, right? That's the person with faith. They're positive people, and to some of us, they can be a little bit annoying because you're just like, dude, like, I, I get it, like, I agree, you know, but you're kind of more the realist, okay? The person with faith can kind of be a little bit frustrating to you, but man, do we need people with that gift of faith that believe God can do the impossible. Next is the gift of intercession. This is the ability to pray for extended periods of time on a regular basis and see frequent and specific answers to their prayers. Next is the gift of miracles. The gift of miracles may include the working of divine power and deliverance from danger, an intervention to meet special needs in the physical world, in judgment on those who irrationally and violently oppose the gospel message, in vanquishing the demonic forces that wage war against the church, and in any other way in which God's power is manifested in an evident way to further God's purposes in a situation. And then kind of distinguished from the gift of miracles is the gift of healing. Those with the gift of healing will be those who find that their prayers for healing are answered more frequently and more thoroughly than others. These healings grant us a foretaste, a glimpse of the physical healing, which he will grant us fully in the future, in the kingdom of God. And then next is the gift of distinguishing between spirits, the special ability to recognize the influence of the Holy Spirit or of demonic spirits in a person and identify spiritual warfare. This is the gift of distinguishing between spirits. And then last, finally, is the gift of tongues or interpretation of, of, of tongues. Speaking in tongues in public is public or private prayer or praise spoken in syllables not understood by the speaker. And then for a public tongue, you have the corresponding gift of interpretation of tongues is the ability to report to the church the general meaning of something spoken in tongues in a public gathering of the church. Two notes about the gift of tongues. One, sometimes it's done in public. And if it's done in public, the scripture is crystal clear that one would go at a time. So they're not, you know, going, trying to speak over each other. So you would go one at a time and following each tongue, there would be an interpretation, or otherwise you're doing it in a disorderly or unbiblical manner. So if there's a tongue spoken, there's always going to be followed by the interpretation of that tongue when it's done in a public setting. Years ago, when I was in college, I was in a church called Brooklyn Tabernacle in Brooklyn, New York, and I was at a, a, a gathering, and in the middle of that gathering, 
someone stood up and began to speak in a tongue, an unknown language. And that person sat down and right after that, someone else stood up and in English interpreted everything that person just said and then sat down and it was powerful. Now, I know if you're like Baptist background, you're like, I don't know, bro, okay? I know, I get it. Listen, that was my background too, but it was powerful. When it is done in a biblical way, it is encouraging. It's faith building. It, it, it builds you, it encourages you when you see it done in a biblical way. And that's the way you do it in public. And we actually have specific direction there in the scripture. And then if it's private, this would be like a private prayer language. Their interpretation is not needed because it's just between the person and God. And then finally, when it comes to tongues, there is no doubt, it is crystal clear that tongues is a gift of the Holy Spirit, just like any other gift, which means not all are gonna have it. In fact, Paul explicitly, clearly says, are all gonna speak in tongues? No, it's a gift of the Holy Spirit. It is absolutely clear in scripture that not all are going to have this tongue or this gift. And I, I know some of you grew up in a setting or in a background where it said, hey, if you are a Christian, uh, you, you have the, you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, you're gonna speak in tongues. That's the sign of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And that's just not true. It's just not true. It is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Some people have it, some people don't. But regardless of what gift you have, it's important that you operate in your gift in the spirit of the gifts, in the spirit of in the right spirit of the gifts. And here's what this practically looks like. The right spirit of the gifts is number one, you submit, you're always submitting to the word of God. No matter what gift you have or gift set you have, you're always submitting to the word. Secondly, you're submitting to growth. You're, you're not gonna be given the, the largest stage or, the, or the, the biggest position immediately when you're first starting out serving in your gift. Now you're gonna grow in your gifting. And so oftentimes you're gonna start in a small group or, or volunteering somewhere, and then you're gonna grow in your experience and in your education of that gift and be given larger and more opportunities. And then finally, it submits to the elders, to the local leadership of a church. You don't ever go up to pastors and say, hey, I've got this gift, and so here's what I'm gonna do. You hear the arrogance there? That's not the right spirit of the gift. It's, hey, I'm sensing this gift. You're letting other people speak into it and confirm that's a gift. And then oftentimes you're gonna start out in a smaller stage, in a smaller situation. You're gonna grow in your gifting, in your experience, and in your education as that gift is tested. But here's the question you need to be asking yourself right now. If I were to ask you, and I'm asking you right now, what is your gift? What would you say? Could you say, well, here's my, here's my top three gifts. Do, do you know that? Like, do you know what your gift is? And then secondly, are you utilizing your gift? Do you know what your gift is and are you utilizing your gift? Because if you're a Christian, you've received the Holy Spirit, you've been given a spiritual gift or gifts. And the scripture is calling, God is saying like, you need to use your gift. You've been gifted in a certain way by the Holy Spirit. You need to use that gift for the glory of God and for the building up of the church. So do you know your gift and are you utilizing that gift? And if you're like, man, I don't know what my gift is, that's totally fine. But you need to, you need to start there and say, I don't know what it is, but then you need to go on a process of discovery where you just start serving. You, you just start ministering in like different context and you see where God starts to bring blessing. You see where God starts to bring confirmation through the body of Christ. You get in a small group, you start volunteering in kids or youth or, or, or somewhere in greeting somewhere and you begin to discover maybe what your gifts are. This next week, we're gonna have spiritual gift tests in our daily devotionals on our app and we're gonna do it in our groups. And these aren't definitive, but they can be helpful for you to at least sense what you believe your own gift is, but then there's a process of getting confirmation from others and, and then growing in that gift. When I was in high school, I felt called to ministry and I was scared to death. I felt like the Lord was saying, hey, I'm gonna gift you with teaching and preaching and all that and leadership. And I was like, um, I, I don't wanna do that. Like I was scared to death to get up in front of my class at school, like and give a presentation. Like I was like, no way, I don't wanna be up in front of people. But as I continue to pray about that, I eventually told my mom and she just busted out crying. She said, Clayton, um, God told me a long time ago that he was gonna call you into ministry and I've been praying for you ever since to be obedient to that call. 
I'll never forget sitting in South Plains Mall in front of Chick-fil-A and us just crying our eyes out as I felt like the Lord was confirming, like scary, like, oh my gosh, like this is real, this is real, you know, like this is the ways he's gifted me. Wasn't long after that, my youth pastor's wife, Amy Kelly, come up to me and, and said, hey, Clayton, I don't ever do this, but I just feel like God told me to tell you this. And she kind of gave me a, a word of knowledge, a prophecy, just about what the Lord had gifted me in. And it just, it confirmed everything that I felt like the Lord was telling me. I started leading a kid, a youth small group for seventh grade boys. I started volunteering in my kids' ministry. When I was a freshman at Tech, sophomore at Tech, rather, I transferred from Tech to Wayland to go get my degree in Christian ministry. So it was a process of sensing from the Lord, confirmation from others, experience and education. And then round and round we go, sensing from the Lord, confirmation from others, education, experience. That's what it looks like to discover your gift. And I wanna invite you, if you don't know, you gotta enter into that process. And I just wanna tell you too, it's never too late. No matter how old you are, it is never too late to discover your gifts, to sense God might be doing something new in your life and in your heart. My father-in-law is about to be at retirement age. His name's Kobe. He goes to our church. He serves out at Hope City. And in his time at Hope City, he's felt like the Lord's gifted him in all these kind of new ways, put new vision on his heart, new passion for ministry. And I mean, he's gonna retire and he has no idea what his retirement's gonna look like because now the Lord's just putting all this new like gifting and vision and passion on him. It's never too late to discover your gift and to start using it. Here's the big idea today. I have a gift to give, I have a part to play. Every one of you, if you're a follower of Jesus, you have a gift to give, you have a part to play. And I know you might think, well, you guys got everything covered. I know it looks like that, okay? I get it, right? I get that it looks like that. <laughs> no, not everything is covered. We got a lot of needs. We need to cover a lot of things in our own house a whole lot better. And there's so much more we could be doing if all of us were in the game because there are no bench warmers in the kingdom of God, using our gift and playing our part. Some of us grew up going to work with our dad. Not all of us grew up in an environment like that, but some of us, we go to work with our dad, we go to work with our mom. And I don't know about you, if you ever got to do that, you felt really special. Listen, your heavenly father, is calling for you to go to work with him. That's how much he thinks of you. Every last one of you. Doesn't matter what you think of yourself or what you've been, where you've been, what you've done. Your heavenly father is calling you to go to work with him. And what a special thing that is. To have a gift to give, to have a part to play. We're one body with many parts on mission for Jesus and we need every part. And because you have a gift to give, listen to me. Because you have a gift to give, it means you're a gift to this church. You, if you're a follower, everyone, you are a gift to this church. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your word, for how it speaks to us, comforts us, convicts us, and Holy Spirit, just do all of that in our hearts right now. God, begin to identify gifts and move in our hearts, God, to, to utilize those gifts for the glory of God and for the building up of the church. God, I pray that as a result of this series, you would transform us and transform our church. God, to look more and more like the church you you're calling us to be, you desire for us to be. And God, I pray that we, as we look at those, just even back to week one, those metaphors of the church, the body, the, the building, the, the, the bride, the branch, God, would you transform and grow our church to look more and more like those metaphors, those pictures we, we see as a result of this series. One body, many parts. In your name we pray, amen. Would you stand as our team leads us in worship?